Good afternoon. Good afternoon both to the folks that are joining us here at the Chancery as well as those that are connected by way of the internet on the webinar. And uh, we'll also do a welcome for those that uh, will vi view us and visit this in the future as we're recording this as well. My name is Kent Ferris. I'm the Director of Social Action and Catholic Charities for the Diocese of Davenport. We welcome uh, our friends and, and new friends uh, to the event this afternoon. Uh, we are uh, co-presenting with the um, members of the National Alliance on Mental Illness from the greater Mississippi Valley as well as uh, NAMI of Johnson County. Our guests, uh, guest speakers are Dean Drexel, who's a board member of NAMI from Greater Mississippi Valley, Anna Goodwin, trainer with NAMI Greater Mississippi Valley, and also joining us is Carol Porch, board member, NAMI Johnson County. We begin in prayer this afternoon. Prayer for protection during the storms of life. Loving God, maker of heaven and earth, protect us in your love and mercy. Send the Spirit of Jesus to be with us, to still our fears and give us confidence. In the stormy waters, Jesus reassured his disciples by his presence, calmed the storm, and strengthened their faith. Guard us from harm during the storms of life and renew our faith to serve you faithfully. Give us the courage to face all difficulties and the wisdom to see the ways your Spirit binds us together in mutual assistance. With confidence we make our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll toggle back and forth between uh, notes that I'm sharing as well as those that uh, Dean and, and Anna and uh, Carol will share. I'd like to, right out of the gate, tell you the source of my information. And as you can see, first of all, it's from the Commission on Mental Illness and Faith and Fellowship for People with Mental Illness from the Archdiocese of Chicago. Um, they've, they've done a lot of of pulling together of information relevant to particular faith communities. Uh, they are our close neighbor and they've also, um, the resource material that I'm referencing, which could be of benefit to parishes, um, the Archdiocese of Chicago and particular Deacon Lambert have done a lot of work. The second source is the National Catholic Partnership on Disability, Executive Director Jan Benton in Washington. Here again, she has, a, um, she has a manual titled Welcome and, Welcomed and Valued, which is a, a parish handbook for those that are wanting to go in greater depth than the one hour we're providing this afternoon. And then the third source of information is NAMI FaithNet. And I again need to remind myself and those that are listening that it's not exclusively a Catholic audience. We also have members of uh, the military that have uh, signed up and want the information that we're providing um, as it would be of interest to different faith communities and how they're reaching out and supporting members of their, their parishes or congregations. Specific to uh, the Catholic faith, there are a couple of quotes I wanted to make reference to and the first one is from the Second Vatican Council. As individuals and as a nation, therefore, we are called to make a fundamental option for the poor, the obligation to evaluate social and economic activity from the viewpoint of the poor and the powerless arises from the radical command to love one's neighbor as one's self. Those who've been marginalized and whose rights are denied have privileged claims if society is to provide justice for all. This obligation is deeply rooted in Christian belief. And as a matter of justice, it happens to be rather common language amongst the different faiths. And second, as far as the need to create supportive faith communities, and this a quote from uh, Pope Benedict XVI, I commend pastoral workers and voluntary associations and organizations to support in practical ways and through concrete initiatives 
those families who, who have mentally ill people dependent on them. I hope that the culture of acceptance and sharing will grow and spread to them. I will now turn the microphone over to my colleague, Dean, and have him uh, continue on with the, the next part of our presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Ken, for the introduction and for okay. technical. That good? Okay. Thank you again for uh, having us here this afternoon. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk with you concerning the Bridges of Hope faith communities in NAMI. Uh, this particular presentation was put together by the National NAMI, but today we're going to examine the troubled waters of mental illness and two strong bridges that have helped many people and families navigate the deep waters of mood and thought disorders. These bridges of hope are faith communities and NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. During our time together today, we plan to answer three questions. What is mental illness and what is its impact on individuals, families, and the community? What is the role of faith communities in recovery? And third, what is this organization called NAMI? It's got a national, a state, and local affiliates, and what resources are available from them. And we're also going to extend an invitation to everyone to join us in the NAMI walk on September 28th. If we recognize mental illness and major problems they pose for people, then we can be helpful. But many congregations don't know how to help. Perhaps they don't have the information or perhaps they're fearful of helping. So we want you to know about how NAMI can provide another bridge to strong advocacy, education, and support programs. Many individuals and families don't recognize the early unusual behavioral thoughts or moods as treatable biological based brain disorders. So if the mental illness goes untreated, it can turn into a rushing torrent and sweeping away the affected person's ability to lead normal, healthy lives. One NAMI family member described their experience in this way. When things were at the worst, it seemed like the illness was in control and that our entire family was being dragged down. Pulled under, we were all overwhelmed and helpless. We felt stranded and alone on the shore as it seemed our son was being swept away by schizophrenia. Out of reach and forever lost to us as the person we had known. We felt helpless to help him and knew no one who could explain what was happening to him and us. Even today, as advances in research and treatment options with the advances of treatment options there are still people who know too little or nothing about serious mental illness. They may struggle themselves or know others who suffer, but there are so many other ways to help if only they knew how. Too many ill moms, dads, veterans, youth, boys and girls simply drift away, caught in the rapids of emotional and mental torment. Families are torn apart, lost, or wasted. 
Coping with mental illness is bad enough, but to get the proper treatment is even more difficult, especially if you don't have adequate health insurance or health coverage or have no advocate to help you overcome the barriers to treatment. This is really unacceptable in times of plenty and disastrous in our current economic situation. Many individuals still find limited resources and broken linkage between healthcare providers, housing assistance, and social services. Before we go any further, let's be clear about what we're talking about with mental illness. Ah, thank you. First and foremost, it's a serious medical condition. These are medical conditions, disorders of the brain that disrupt the person's thinking, mood, ability to relate to others and perform daily functions. Just as diabetes is a medical disorder of the pancreas, mental illnesses are biologically based disorders of the brain that can result in diminished capacity for coping with ordinary demands of life. Major mental illnesses include major depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and borderline personality. These are equal opportunity illnesses. They affect everyone regardless of age, race, income. Or they're not the result of poor upbringing or lack of character. Untreated, they can have serious long-term consequences, leading to permanent disability, which is loss of job, loss of income, could be loss of a marriage, a house, but they are treatable for the most part. Most people with a diagnosis of mental illness can experience at least some degree of relief from the symptoms by participating in an individually individualized treatment plan, which will include medication, counseling, and community support programs. Many may regain a productive life, though it may be a little different than the life they would have had without the depression, without the schizophrenia, or the bipolar illness, but there's hope and there's help now. I imagine we can agree that everyone experiences wide ranges of sadness and happiness, sorrow and gladness throughout their lives. Mental and emotional swings are pretty common in human life and simply part of being human. So how do we know when we or someone else we know might be experiencing a serious medical condition that is causing a mood or thought disorder? Though we shouldn't try to diagnose anyone, it's helpful to know that some of the red flags that may hint at the possibility of a serious mental illness. The American Psychiatric Association indicates there are 10 warning signs of a serious mental illness. The first one is a marked change in personality, whereby a person who one day or normally would be happy, outgoing, productive at work, uh, has a change in personality where they're withdrawn, isolated, inability to work. Uh, this would be a, a warning sign. Inability to cope with problems in daily activities. For persons with a serious mental illness, losing the car keys can be, cause a major meltdown. Having to make out a grocery list and go shopping, uh, write out a check, is almost an impossible task for some folks with serious mental illnesses. They may have strange or grandiose ideas, thinking that they can do things that normally the family would know they couldn't. They're going to climb Mount Everest, they're going to be run a sub four minute mile. Uh, they may be uh, going to be the next mayor of Chicago or whatever, but these thoughts are part of the illness. There's excessive anxiety. At times, a person may be crippled with so much anxiety they won't be able to get out of the house or even get out of bed. Prolonged periods of 
depression or apathy are common with long-term mental illnesses, as are marked changes in eating or sleeping habits. Uh, at times, these folks that have the serious mental illness will have their days and nights mixed up. They'll be sleeping all day and awake all night, going through the house, and, which is quite disruptive to other family members. Or the eating, they would, uh, normal eating patterns would switch either to gluttonous type of eating, devouring anything that's in a, a bag, box, or a carryout carton, or at the other extreme, not being able or wanting to eat it all, losing a lot of weight and becoming medically frail because of it. Thinking and talking about suicide, this can be veiled thoughts or, or mentioning all the way up to life's not worth living, I'm gonna kill myself, I have a gun. These are serious uh, issues that should be brought to a professional's attention. Extreme highs and lows. Mood changes or activity levels can change on a daily basis uh, where the person may be uh, unable to get out of bed in the morning and at night are just all over the place, uh, can't slow them down. The abuse of alcohol and drugs is another warning signal. Uh, people that experience psychiatric symptoms oftentimes tend to self-medicate uh, alcohol uh, tends to relieve depression for a time. Uh, marijuana, a street drug, relieves some of the symptoms of schizophrenia. Excessive anger and hostility or violent behavior. The inappropriate behavior outbursts could be directed at family members, coworkers, bosses, um, government officials, the postman, uh, even the clergy or the office secretaries. If a person displays one or more of these warning signs consistently over a two week period, they should be evaluated by a mental health professional. It won't help to tell them to get their act together if they truly have a brain disorder any more than telling a person that's got a broken leg, get up and walk. I hope this helps clarify some of the differences between normal thought and mood and uh, abnormal mood disorders. How prevalent is mental health? I would think that now you're asking, I've never heard anybody talk about it in the congregation or maybe they're whispering it in the corner or uh, somebody at the checkout line may have said something, but it's not something people talk about regularly. But if we consider communities, faith communities to be microcosms of a larger population, the facts on your screen will relate to the prevalence of mood and thought disorders in your congregation. One in four adults experiences a mental health disorder in a given year. About one in 17 lives with a serious mental illness. By that I mean someone who has a bipolar, major depressive or a schizophrenic disorder. 26% of the homeless population also has serious mental disorders. There's an estimated 5.2 million people that have both substance abuse and mental health issues or addiction disorders, can be alcohol also. Continuing on, our jails seem to be treatment facilities, if that's what we can call them, for a lot of mentally ill folks. I think this number is maybe a little light, but uh, 20 to 25 percent of jail and prison inmates and youth involved with juvenile justice systems have a mental illness. Um, I think that number is higher. It's unfortunate. We lose one life to suicide every 15.8 minutes. Now let's think about that a moment. This webinar is gonna last a little over an hour. During that time, there'll be four people in our country that will have killed themselves in suicide. Suicide is the 11th leading cause of death in the United States. The third leading cause of death in ages 10 to 12, 24. Um, 
Over 90% of those who take their own lives have a diagno diagnosable mental illness. And finally, the baby boomers have seen an increase in suicide rates. They rose 45% between 1999 and 2010. And uh, I consider myself, I'm on the one early end of the baby boomers or pre-baby boomer. But uh, this increase in suicides is, can be attributed uh, to uh, the financial woes that they've experienced in the recent years and also being sandwiched and caring for their parents and adult children. This has taken a lot of stress and a lot of toll on families. So the rates are considerably increased. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the statistics on some of the major illnesses. Uh, major depressive disorder affects 6.7% of the adults. That's about 14.8 million. Now, is it any wonder that you and I are seeing an awful lot of commercials on TV for antidepressants? A lot of people out there with major depression. About 2.4 million Americans live with schizophrenia. That's a little over 1.1% of the population. Bipolar illness affects the lives of 5.7 million adults. This is approximately 2.6% of the population. Um, this might be a surprise, but the biggest category of serious mental illness is anxiety disorders, affecting over 18% of the adults. 40 million people are dealing with anxiety disorders. Um, these include phobias, obsessive compulsive uh, behavior, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorders also are the seat of a lot of physical ailments that get misdiagnosed, or not misdiagnosed, but get treated at the doctor's office. 20% of the doctor's visits are related to the physical symptoms of anxiety. Shortness of breath, dizziness, insomnia, lack of concentration, uh, physical aches and pains, gastral problems. Many of these things are physical symptoms that anxiety disorders cause. So, and this last bit of information is fairly striking. Uh, adults with the serious mental illness are likely to die 25 years younger than other Americans. These were talking about the bipolar, the major depressive, and the schizophrenic illnesses. Uh, largely due to treatable medical conditions that these folks unfortunately haven't taken care of during their lifetime. So uh, a lot of premature deaths, and I've experienced this firsthand in the work I've done uh, with uh, supported housing we had people moving in in their uh, late 40s, early 50s, and, you know, had died early from natural causes. And uh, um, so not that they don't want to take care of themselves, but the illness affects their ability to take care of their medical problems. Uh, the prevalence of mental illness in children has been increasing. Uh, in adolescents, uh, are on the rise. Half of the cases of lifetime mental illness begin by the age of 14 and three quarters by the age of 24. One in 10 children with, lives with a serious mental illness and it affects their, their school activities, their social interaction, and the dropout rate and failure rate. Research today shows that Early diagnosis and treatment of children with serious mood or thought disorders significantly improves their chances for recovery and to lead successful lives. This is also true of adults that have mental illness and discovered later in life. Despite effective treatments, there are long delays when people seek and receive treatment. Fewer than one-third of the 
adults and half the children with a diagnosable mental illness fail to receive any mental health services in a year. Which leads us to the faith, people of faith uh, are not immune to any of the statistics or numbers that I've talked about to the terminal trauma that untreated mental illness can lead to. And with that, I would like to turn over the presentation to Anna Goodwin, who will be talking about uh, the faith community and faith-based uh, services and recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kent, for having us here today. It's uh, always a wonderful opportunity to talk about mental illness and help people learn to know more about it so that they can help other people with mental illness. And um, faith communities all over the country right now are, are doing their best to get some mental health ministry happening. Um, my interest is my call. Um, mental health ministry is who I am. And so uh, it gives me great pleasure to be able to talk to you today about uh, the, the spiritual aspects of mental illness and the questions that we have. You all know somebody who has uh, had an illness or something, some family crisis, and the questions they ask are, where's God in this? Why do bad things happen to good people? What have we done wrong? How can my faith help me heal? What now? Is there meaning? And purpose for my life? Where do I belong? And you've heard these from people who have other, other illnesses, but they're just as valid, and people with mental illnesses in their family ask these same questions. There is a spiritual isolation that also hurts so many people when they have a mental illness in their families, too. They're, they're, uh, there's a lot of fear about speaking about your mental illness and just the stigma that's attached to it. Mental illness can also cause feelings of spiritual isolation and estrangement because they're caught in a turmoil of serious mental illness and they're the loneliest, loneliest, most estranged members of our neighborhoods and communities. Imagine a child whose profoundly depressed mother does not respond at all to a simple, look what I did today in school or who suddenly switches moods and talks on stop for 36 hours and then disappears while she needs hospitalization. Imagine what it's like to have your father tell you before he goes to work to keep an eye on your mother who is potentially suicidal and when you get home from school. But he is so preoccupied that he never really explains what is going on and never asks you how you're doing and neither does anyone else. Imagine what it's like for a homeless young man who at, comes late at night to, the, to sleep in the doorway of the church. He leaves early in the morning before anyone knows he's there. Then one day, exhausted, he sleeps late and is awakened by the custodian. The young man cringes, tired, tearful, sad, and ashamed. The good news is that mental illnesses are treatable and that people can regain control of their lives thanks to advancements in brain research and the development of better medications. Everyone responds differently to the various treatment options available. But for about 75% of people with depression, schizophrenia, severe anxiety disorders, and bipolar disorder, treatment works to varying degrees. So, what is involved in treatment and diagnosis? Usually a thorough examin physical examination because there are many physical ailments that can mock or, or imitate, mimic the, same, um, the mental illnesses. So we wanna make sure that we're really dealing with, a, if we're dealing with a physical illness or a mental illness. Then if there is, doesn't seem to be a physical problem or a physical reason for behaviors, an evaluation by a psychiatrist is helpful. Um, a psychiatrist may recommend more tests, 
uh, may recommend a medication or two or three, depending on the individual. And uh, in a crisis situation, it may be that he recommends, he or she recommends hospitalization. An individual or group counseling by a certified mental health counselor or therapist is very, very helpful. Um, I myself have been through lots of counseling, uh, lots of psychiatrist visits, and I, I find that to be necessary for both of them to be part of my life, for me to, to stay healthy and well. Um, supportive services by a social worker can be helpful in the case of serious mental illness because, as Dean said earlier, sometimes you can't write a check. Sometimes you lose your keys and it, it just sends you all over the edge. So it's necessary to provide more uh, significant help with a person who has a mental illness than sometimes we are ready to believe that they need that help. But it's, it's real. Education about serious illness for the individual, family, and friends. That's the one place where NAMI will come in, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about NAMI later. But that education is so valuable. It hits you out of nowhere, and you have no idea what's going to happen. And you, you need to not feel alone. And there are ways to do that. And the faith community, communities can be part of helping people not feel alone. And of course, healthy eating. Sleeping and exercise habits, which I'm sure everybody who is watching this has, right? Okay, no, take care of yourself because it is important to get your sleep. It is important to eat right and to exercise. There's no one single way to treat mental illnesses. Treatment is different for each individual. Some people find alternative and naturopathic ways that help them toward recovery. So it's very different. There's no one solution. So, what is the role of faith communities? They are in a unique position to help people living with serious mental illness. Let's look at some of the factors that give communities, faith communities the edge on being supportive and helpful in this area. First of all, clergy are you often the first person you, you may turn to in a serious crisis. They're usually on the front lines of mental and emotional crises but few clergy feel prepared to respond effectively to those experiencing a psychiatric disturbance. Furthermore, churches are more numerous than mental health care providers and they are more evenly distributed geographically. You may be living in a place that doesn't have any mental health care, and, uh, but you do have several churches and you may have a church family that's helping you uh, with, with what you're struggling with and they can, you, the faith community can help you move forward. Faith groups already provide educational settings, so a larger percentage of Americans can gain awareness and get the help they need. Faith groups are already committed to social justice issues and advocacy for the marginalized, poor, and oppressed. Many individuals affected by mental illness, faith is the key component in their recovery. I saw this myself when I was uh, first facilitating support group for people with mental illness that was then called NAMI Care. And I noticed that the more, the, the people who were saying more about their faith life and sharing how important their faith life was to them, those were the people who were doing better in recovery. And I think that's an important point for us to realize that that faith life, that faith community, that family is who can help them very much get into the recovery and stay and grow. Putting it simply, congregations provide a place to belong and experience hope. By learning about mental illnesses and treatment options, people of faith can do more proactively support individuals living with mental illness and their families. They can help maximize an ill person's recovery potential. So how do you do that? How we, can we provide those bridges of hope to those who feel they don't belong? Let me give you an example from Ellen Sachs, a lawyer and professor of psychology at the University of Southern California. She describes in her book, The Center Cannot Hold, how when she had cancer, she was visited in the hospital and supported in her recovery with notes and cards, meals for her family, prayers, support for treatment, a welcome back when she had cancer. Then she contrasts that with, and I guess you can guess what happens because you can see the red circle with the line through it, 
what happened when she was hospitalized with schizophrenia. She was alone in her recovery. She had no visits, no cards, no meals, no prayers, no support, or welcome back. Of course, we need to be sensitive to a person's desire for privacy, but these simple acts of love let the person know we care and miss them when they are absent, no matter what kind of illness they have. These underlying elements of basic care for people with mental illness will make the cards, meals, and phone calls much more appreciated. Learning to recognize the illness and accept the person just as they are is fundamental. That may take effort on our part, but care and concern may be misdirected if we don't understand the kind of illness that they have. Second, assist in finding the need, help needed. Perhaps that's providing a list of social services and a mental health care provider. Your NAMI affiliate, if you have one, uh, may help be able to help you with that. They probably have that list already. Third, we need to make it clear from the pulpit and in all teaching settings that we support medical treatment and counseling in addition to prayer and spiritual practices. Let, if people feel judged for having a problem, they won't choose to seek help. Fourth, we must attend to the individual's basic needs, a coat, shelter, a meal, or transportation to the doctor. This is often the door to nurturing their spiritual growth. Types of spiritual growth, after the basic physical and medical needs of a person are met, there's a deeper level of social support that, and care that often gets overlooked. The gift of presence requires that we avoid doing for them what they can do for themselves, giving them advice or pushing our own agenda. As we listen and share their journey, we ask honest, open questions that will help them express their goals as well as what they need and want. And let's not underestimate the power of prayer support. One woman, after being told by her hospital chaplain that he would be praying for her over the weekend, told him on Monday morning how much that better she felt each morning on Saturday and Sunday knowing that he was praying for her. Mental illnesses impact the family as well as the ill person. So faith groups need to make a concerted effort to reach out to these families. We need to learn about mental illnesses and the specific needs of the parent, spouse, or child. But most often, families just need someone who will walk across that bridge and be a friend, especially when their loved one goes far off their medications or community services fall short. We need to learn what is helpful or hurtful to say or not to say. Examples of a helpful, mark, a helpful remark would be that you make sure they know the truth of God's love, mercy, forgiveness, and act accurately depict God's power and holiness and correct any wrong, mis wrong perceptions. Show them how God sees them, wiped clean by Christ's sacrifice holy and acceptable to him as beloved children. An unhelpful remark or hurtful remark would be telling a person to read more scripture or pray more. It is much like turning, trying to turn a lamp on in a house as usual, but the bulb is turned, burned out and no light. No matter how many times you bang that switch, no light is going to shine. As we said before, offering information about community health resources is often needed and appreciated. So if you meet somebody that is struggling, you might want to do some research. And NAMI is a good place to do that research. Okay, we've talked a lot about, I'm going to move this arrow. There we go. I want to go forward. Uh, we've talked about practical and spiritual care. Now let's explore ways we can educate and raise awareness in the congregation on a regular basis. Are you familiar with the national awareness seasons during which we can help break the silence and the shame associated with mental illness? May is Mental Health Month. You can get some information about Mental Health Month and things you can do from um, Mental Health America. If you, go, if you Google Mental Health America, you'll find it there. 
July is Minority Mental Health Month. September is National Recovery Month, which we didn't have a generation ago. We didn't talk about recovery. It's been the, the advancement of research and medications that's allowed us to start thinking about recovery and people living productive lives again. The first week of October is Mental Illness Awareness Week, and it is different from all the rest of them say health. The illness, we want to really draw attention to what it's like to have a mental illness. We, everybody is happy to talk about mental health, but it's hard to talk about mental illness. Tuesday of that week is the National Day of Prayer for Mental Illness Recovery and Understanding. That might be a good place for you to start with your parish. So some ideas for uh, observing Awareness Month in order to create awareness in your parish. Just choose one or two activities at first to observe a National Mental Health Month or day or week. You could write an article for your congregation's newsletter or bulletin, compose a prayer, a poem, or a song to share in a service, small group, or adult education class. Schedule a speaker from NAMI or a mental health professional. You may even have one, someone in your parish who is willing to do that. Invite members of your faith community to participate in your NAMI walk. And Dean's going to talk about our local NAMI walk here in Scott County, uh, Greater Mississippi Valley, a little later on. Or participate in the state NAMI walk. You can create a bulletin board. The possibilities are numerous. Again, if you are interested in downloadable resources, check out the NAMI FaithNet Awareness Toolkit. And here's the, uh, ad, uh, the URL address on the screen and the slide, nami.org slash faithnet. Questions to consider. Before we go on, let's relate this to your parish. Here are some questions to consider. What is your parish already doing to provide hope for people touched by mental illness? What would you like to see it do? What are you willing to help with? What other ideas might you have? And then right now I invite you to share your answers to these questions, or if you have some ideas and you've already done some things with this parish, go ahead and type them in and we'll get to that after, the, uh, after we're done with the presentation. But please go ahead and submit those questions and um, ideas that you have. These types of Awareness Week activities for the entire congregation truly bring hope to families and individuals who feel isolated by mental illness. And did you know that giving support is exactly how the story of National Alliance on Mental Illness started? NAMI began in the 19, late 1970s. You might say NAMI became a bridge of hope for several women who, whose mutual support changed lives. Harriet Shelter's son was diagnosed with schizophrenia. When she shared her anxiety with a friend in a church, the friend put her in touch with another member of the congregation, Beverly Young. Beverly faced similar challenges with her own son who had a mental illness. Harriet and Beverly met for lunch in 1977 for mutual support, and within six months, their efforts brought together 75 people. AMI, A-M-I, the Alliance for the Mentally Ill, an earlier chapter in NAMI's life, was formed in Madison, Wisconsin. Things haven't been the same since for them and thousands of other NAMI members. Okay, we've been talking about NAMI, NAMI, NAMI. What is NAMI? National Alliance on Mental Illness. It's almost 35 years later that from when Harriet was, Harriet and, um, I just forgot her name. Harriet and Beverly um, met for the first time. And the National Alliance on Mental Illness is the largest, most influential, grassroots, self-help ad self advocacy organization in the U.S. It is dedicated to improving the lives of people affected by serious mental illness through education, advocacy, support, and research. NAMI is a three-tiered organization with local affiliates working with and under the state organizations who in turn work with and under the NAMI national umbrella. The programs are different from those of many other advocacy organization because they are based on the peer-led lived experience approach. 
So if you are taking a, the family to family course, you're being taught by a person who has a family member who has mental illness. If you're taking a consumer class or a peer class, then that person who's teaching that class has had a mental illness and have the same lived experience as you have. So I think that's one of the unique things about NAMI is that people have been where you have been. And that's, when you have a mental illness, sometimes it's really hard to tell somebody who hasn't had, what, what hasn't had one how difficult it is and what an experience you is. So having that peer is very important. While many NAMI members are mental health professionals, friends and supporter, the majority of our members are family members and persons themselves who have navigated the tumultuous seas of mental illness and are living productive lives. Again, there's the NAMI website, nami.org, very easy to remember. Um, and NAMI offers several signature programs that are offered at no expense to the participants. And here are just a few of them. Family to Family is a 12-week course for family and caregivers of those living with a brain disorder. NAMI Connection is a peer-led recovery support group that meets regularly for persons who have been diagnosed with a mental illness. NAMI Family Support groups offer mutual encouragement and support to family and friends of those living with mental illness. Peer to Peer is an eight-week course for persons who live with a diagnosis but are stable and ready to take responsibility for their own recovery. And I think that's actually a 10-week course. I think that's a typo. I think that should be 10 weeks now. And there are many others we don't have time to describe. But one of the greatest benefits of all of our NAMI programs is that people discover that they are not alone, that someone else understands. There are three local affiliates that are located in the Davenport Diocese, and we all offer different kinds of programming, and that's why we call it a grassroots organization, because it, the local affiliate decides what they can offer in their air, own area. And on the screen right now, I have the Greater Mississippi Valley, which was formerly the Scott County affiliate. The title was Scott County. As the Greater Mississippi Valley, we serve six counties, three in Illinois and three in Iowa. And the three in Iowa are Scott, Clinton, and Muscatine. So if you live in those three counties, you can get in touch with NAMI Greater Mississippi Valley and we'll be happy to help you out with any questions that you might have or help you offer these classes where you are. Um, the, so there's the contact information. There's also a NAMI Johnson County and we all have Carol come up here in just a moment to talk about that and uh, NAMI Jasper County in Newton. Each affiliate provides programming that fits their own needs and abilities. Sometimes you'll have a larger affiliate that can offer a lot, like Greater Mississippi Valley. And sometimes in Jasper County, you'll see that there's only one course that they offer, but there's support available. This contact information for NAMI Greater Mississippi Valley on the side will get you information about the signature programs we offer. Family to Family, NAMI Connection, Family Support Group, Peer to Peer, In Our Own Voice, and NAMI Basics. We also have a suicide bereavement group and offer other programs during the year, other events during the year. We have a Christmas party and things like that. So Carol uh, Porch, who, uh, whom I work with at the national level on the NAMI Connection, rolling out the NAMI Connection program, is here from uh, the Johnson County affiliate. And I'm going to let her talk a little bit because she knows more than I do about Johnson County. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Oops. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I'm going to give you the microphone. And it's probably making all kinds of nasty sounds. I'll be short and to the point. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening today, and I just have some brief things to say about NAMI Johnson County. There's the contact. Mary Isa is our office coordinator. There is our website and our email and our phone. We do have a regular program meeting once a night. That's the third Wednesday of the month at Mercy Hospital. I believe that starts at 6.30 with uh, support groups ahead of that. Uh, if you'd like to check the exact time and what the program is, please call. We do have an office that is open on a regular basis. We don't have that address there, but it's located at 
220 Lafayette Street. It's kind of hard to find, so I'll describe it. If you go south from Burlington, past the post office, you take a left directly onto Lafayette Street, drive as far east as you can, and turn left at the Long Grain Building and drive to the north end. Our office is right there, and people there would be glad to help you and give you information. Uh, NAMI Johnson County offers uh, numerous programs, family to family, NAMI Connection, which meets on Tuesday nights, Family Support Group, which meets Thursdays at our office, and Peer to Peer, as well as In Our Own Voice. And we too have many programs through the, out the year, uh, special events and so forth. One thing I would like to point out is if you do not have an affiliate in your area, when you go to the NAMI website, there is a place to click there and check and see if there's another affiliate perhaps close to uh, wherever people live or wherever they're at. We have about 20, I believe, in Iowa right now. And you can call the state office at 800-417-0417. She did more. No know lots more about what Johnson County is doing and I've never been to their building so I'm glad for the directions there. Thank you, Carol. NAMI Jasper County is one of those smaller affiliates um, but they do have people that are trained to teach family to family so if you get a group that's interested in taking that class they'd be happy to offer it. The contact people, they don't have an office, they're small um, but your contact people are William Ayler and Marilyn Deppy, and they are uh, president and vice president of their board. Um, also, as Carol said, there is NAMI Iowa. It is located in Des Moines, so if you want more information, you can also go to their website, namiiowa.com, and it is .com. I looked it up to make sure that it wasn't .org, it's .com. NAMI, N-A-M-I, Iowa, I-O-W-A, then that's two I's and you can get more information that way. The bridge of hope your faith community builds will look different from that built by other organizations and faith groups. Untreated, mental illness can be challenging and destructive for individuals, for people of faith, for families, and for society in general. But our bridges of hope can span the destructive forces of mental illness when we combine our resources with those of mental health providers and community organizations like NAMI. The important thing is that people around you living with a mental illness know that they are not alone, that someone can help them over the tumultuous waters of serious mental illness and into a community of care and spiritual nature. We all need to be reminded of something Rosalind Carter said, and I quote, you can make a difference. You can make a difference. You can make a difference. People with mental problems are our neighbors. They are members of our congregations, members of our families. They're everywhere in this country. If we ignore their cries for help, we will be continuing to participate in the anguish from which those cries of help come. A problem of this magnitude will not just go away. Because it will not go away, and because of our spiritual commitments, we are compelled to take action. The NAMI Hope page and helpline will help you connect with a wide variety of, and range of information that we've not had time to cover today. You don't need to be the experts. None of us know all the answers. We simply need to know what and where resources are available. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, please submit any questions you have and we'll try to get to those if we have enough time and I see we're coming up close on the end of, the, of our talk. Here's, um, I want to share just one hopeful story. It was 10 years from the time our son first showed abnormal behavior until he was adequately diagnosed and treated. That was after we found a NAMI support group and family to family education course. Through family to family, we learned that depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety disorder, and obsessive compulsive, compulsive disorder are biologically based and treatable. We also learned that recovery is possible. We find, finally could hope for a fuller, more meaningful life for our son and family. NAMI has become the bridge of hope for this family and many, many others. 
Um, let me pause for a moment here. Kent, do you want to stop right at three? We, we can go a little bit longer. I've got a couple more slides. Okay. Uh, Dean, you want to come up and talk about the NAMI walk then? I can briefly. As Dean comes up, here are some other online resources. I don't know if Kent had an opportunity to send out the slides, but um, if you want to uh, get in contact with Kent, he can give you this information as well. And now, because we have uh, everything needs a commercial, um, we're going to we're going to Dean's going to give you a short commercial break on uh, the NAMI Walk for Nam Greater Mississippi Valley. There you go. Thank you, Anna. Uh, as we had mentioned earlier in the program, the NAMI Greater Mississippi Valley is going to have its 10th annual uh, walk on September 28th at Schwieber Park in Rock Island. This is a family event, no cost for the uh, to walk. Uh, we encourage team members to, or parishes, groups, churches, uh, to form teams and uh, the in money that's raised for this program through this walk stays locally to support NAMI programs, education, and uh, advocacy. Uh, last year uh, we raised uh, close to $80,000 and there were 850 participants. So their information on your last slide, uh, if you would be interested in getting together and forming a walk. Uh, you can contact Terry or Greg Pauline and they'll get information to you on that. Uh, no charge to walk, but we encourage donations by the participants to support uh, our programs. Thank you very much. With that, I'll turn it back over to Kent. Thank you, Dean. A couple of items that I wanted to mention, the, the seven uh, core elements of Catholic social teaching uh, directly relate to the topics that we've talked about, including life and dignity, the rights and responsibilities, as well as the option for the poor and vulnerable. Um, what I would say, I'll jump ahead, what, what's next for parishes that are viewing this? Um, one would be to contact our office, the Social Action Office, or the local NAMI representatives that have been listed. Um, as Dean and Anna have talked about, participating in local awareness efforts, um, the NAMI Walk and other ones, promoting educational offerings, providing information sessions, and helping work on legislative advocacy efforts. The, um, the, the social justice responsibilities that our office have uh, would work very well and closely with the efforts that NAMI undertakes. Um, and so I think that there's, uh, there's great opportunity. The other thing I would mention for folks in parishes is the resources available. Um, in, in the Archdiocese of Chicago, they do a full day, they do a nine o'clock to three o'clock uh, uh, information day. So you can easily expand this out and the resources that I'd mentioned at the first, both uh, both the Commission on Mental Illness and Faith from Arch the Archdiocese, as well as all of the NAMI resources, as well as National Catholic Partnership on Disability. They're all very good resources, and if you're wanting to know what the next steps are, we've got the folks that can help you talk through it. Additionally, I'd like to thank um, uh, NAMI of uh, the Mississippi Valley, um, as a professional who was working in uh, child protection and child welfare for many years, I, I realized the value that NAMI had for families that found themselves in some particularly difficult situations. Personally, however, it was a fellow parishioner who reached out to me and shared with me uh, one of the offerings, the family to family uh, program through NAMI and it was 
at that parishioner's encouragement that I participated this past spring in that class. I found it very helpful, not only for the up-to-date research, um, but also um, for the support that I felt amongst class members. And I, I knew after completing that course that I wanted to try to give back a little bit and to connect the diocese with NAMI. And uh, this, this today is part of that. And then also uh, our family will participate in the NAMI walk coming up in September. Do we have any questions from the field? No questions from the field? Um, we're, any questions from the audience here at the, at the Chancery? Very good. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to the NAMI representatives that were with us. And again, if you have questions after watching the video, please, please feel free to contact our office or the, the NAMI representatives. Thank you.